Now, next uh, uh, presentation, Dr. Tari al -Fahd. He is Assistant Professor of Neurology at Kuwait University. Uh, Dr. al -Fahd, the Consultant Neurologist at Ibn Sina Hospital. Uh, Dr. al -Fahd received the MD from Kuwait University and the completed residency in neurology from uh, George Washington University. He had fellowship uh, at uh, in, uh, neuroimmunology Neurovirology and the MS at the National Institute of Health in Maryland. Uh, Dr. Al Fahd uh, conducted several research projects and the clinical trials. He is a diplomate of the American Board of Psychiatry and the Neurology and the MS Sclerosis Certified Specialist. Please welcome Dr. Tari Al Fahd. Thank you, Dr. Samar, for the introduction. And thank you, Dr. Jassim and the organizers for the invitation. So this is my disclosure slide. So my talk will present a structured way to evaluate cases of myelopathy with a focus on pearls and pitfalls in some important cases. So generally speaking, when we look at myelopathy in the textbook, we'll see that they're usually categorized in two ways, a time course into hyperacute, acute, subacute, and chronic, and according to the pathogenesis, whether it's infectious, inflammatory, vascular, et cetera. The problem is when you combine both categorizations, you end with overlap. So with a patient who's presenting with acute deficit, acute myelopathy, this can be vascular, but yet it can be still infectious, inflammatory, and even traumatic causes. For the sake of time of this talk, we will focus on two important categories, vascular and inflammatory, both of which can present with different time frames. <clears throat> So to begin with the classic textbook explanation of myelopathy, we describe the triad of weakness, sensory loss with truncal sensory level, and sphincter dysfunction. However, for neurologists, it's important to remember that some myelopathic syndromes can present with other findings. One important one is pain. This is often present. Sensory level is pathognomonic for spinal cord, especially if it was bilateral and complete. If it was unilateral, if it was incomplete, there are other localization for a sensory level. Urinary retention should make you think of spinal cord injury unless proven otherwise. Many times in the ER, patients are dismissed as UTI and sent home with polycatheter and antibiotics. Acroparesthesia is a tricky one. Usually we're taught that this is pathognomonic for peripheral neuropathy, polyneuropathy. However, if you remember, MS patients almost always have acral paresthesias, numbness in the fingertips and the feet. And this localized more likely to the cervical spinal cord than a peripheral nerve. And lastly, we have to remember that it takes days and weeks, sometimes months, for upper motor neuron signs to take place, to appear in the patient. So don't dismiss the patient right from the ER when they don't have the Binsky sign, for example. So now that we are considering myelopathy as our diagnosis, we have to rule out compression and vascular myelopathy. And I'll talk more about vascular myelopathy to try to convince you why it's important to rule it out from the get-go. So in case of spinal cord infarction, there is very important time to treatment consideration as delays in diagnosis and management can result in poor prognosis for the patient. Also, we have to remember that immunotherapies, the classic ones we use, can be harmful in some cases of spinal cord vascular myelopathy. Vascular myelopathies are one of the frequent cases that are misdiagnosed as transverse myelitis. So when it comes to stroke, there are differences between stroke of the spinal cord and stroke in the brain. So one difference is atherosclerosis and thrombosis are relatively uncommon when dealing with spinal cord stroke. Also, TIAs are less common to be seen in spinal cord and very rarely precede an acute spinal cord vasculopathy. 
pain, whether radicular or visceral, is often an accompanying feature. And it may take several hours to reach the maximum deficit in stroke of the spinal cord, unlike stroke in the brain. Physical activity may be a precipitant of acute spinal cord infarction. So when we're talking about vascular myelopathy, an easy way to look at it is to divide it into arterial, which are the most mostly acute myelopathies, and we will look at periprocedural and spontaneous infarctions. And when we look at venous, which is more likely subacute, we will look at spinal subdural, uh, spinal dural, AV fistula as an example. So classically, when we think of vascular myelopathy, we think of the anterior spinal artery versus the posterior spinal artery territory. And this is not the best way to think about it in uh, clinical practice for the following reasons. Number one, these descriptions were started with cases of syphilis where there were a lot of small vessel vasculitis, so not much collaterals to save the rest of the spinal cord. Also, if you wait for your patient to have this full picture, this will make it really late to do anything for the patient. This is a more realistic uh, presentation of spinal vascular syndromes. So the top row, you can see anterior spinal artery syndromes, and you can notice that almost always the anterior horns are involved since it's metabo metabolically more active part of the spinal cord, and it's in the watershed zone of the spinal cord. Um, beside that, notice in the posterior spinal artery syndromes, that in rare occasions, it might involve the corticospinal tract. PSA syndrome can present with weakness sometimes. And this is the green circle representing the corticospinal tract. So we'll start with periprocedural spinal cord infarction. This is one of the syndromes that are much easier to diagnose because it's almost always associated with a procedure. Two thirds of these procedures are aortic procedures. The other ones have been reported include cardiac surgery, spinal decompression, epidural injection, angiography, nerve block, embolization, and other vascular and thoracic surgeries. So if there is a surgery near the time of vascular myelopathy, think of periprocedural arterial ischemia. These patients most of the time would wake up from anesthesia with maximum deficit. This uh, occurs in 80% of the cases, but it's also important to remember that there might be a delay of hours to days in some patients. Most commonly, we will see flaccid paraplegia, but in one third of them, they will have less severe deficit. And pain is uncommon in patients with periprocedural spinal cord ischemia. When it comes to management, our first step is to get an MRI, hopefully rule out a treatable uh, cause like epidural hematoma. Otherwise, our goal would be to increase the spinal cord perfusion pressure through collaterals. And this is accomplished, accomplished by augmenting the mean arterial pressure and decreasing the CSF pressure by placing a lumbar drain. Now we'll move on to spontaneous spinal cord infarction. Usually these patients would reach maximum deficit within 12 hours. The course might be stuttering. Usually it's severe myelopathy. Some clues to the diagnosis, pain, which occurs in 70% of the patient. Several times they describe physical maneuver. Sometimes it occurs in the elderly with vascular risk factors, but this is not isolated to the elderly. Young people can have it too. Anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal artery syndromes, if, if you see them, this is helpful, but we shouldn't be looking for these. We shouldn't count on these to make the diagnosis. There are some specific signs described with spontaneous spinal cord infarction that I will describe in the next slide. Gadolinium enhancement is common, 40%. The enhancement can also involve nerve roots and vertebral body, which explain basically the common blood supply. CSF can be normal or it might be nonspecific. So in a study by Nicholas Zelensky and his group, they looked at 133 cases of spontaneous spinal cord infarction and they noticed these radiological findings. One, restricted diffusion on diffusion-weighted images and ADC if the MRI was done early. Number two was vertebral body infarction, and it also enhanced. And number three is this linear strip of enhancement. If you see these, they said just more likely in the context of a vascular myelopathy to be arterial, spontaneous spinal cord infarction. Based on that, they came up with 
a recommended diagnostic criteria, which basically focus on that it's acute non-traumatic myelopathy with no alternative explanation and MRI having those specific signs that will increase the yield of it. CSF is expected to be normal. Now, with regard to treatment, acute measures, we will be lucky if we're able to find a trigger and we can jump on to correct it. Examples would be hypotension or shock, so we can work on that. Uh, rare cases, you might be able to find a compression that you can intervene surgically, like a patient here who was reported to have symptoms only when standing and when he lay down, he will recover. And imaging, you can see the artery right here, compressed. This is really hard to find. It's one of those case report kind of situation. You're not gonna find it every time, but it's good to know that there might be causes that you can reverse. This patient recovered uh, later after surgery. Thrombolytic therapy, we use it all the time with stroke of the brain. In the spinal cord, in the literature, there are at least 13 case reports, between case reports and case series. There's no randomized controlled trial that we can draw conclusion from. These case reports, most of them reported favorable outcome and no severe complications. So if you wanna try it, if you have a patient, right presentation, uh, right setup, and you think you wanna try thrombolytic therapy, that's a possibility, but no ironclad evidence to support it so far. Steroids, there is no evidence that it's helpful in cases of arterial ischemia of the spinal cord. And if the patient was with vascular risk factors, it makes sense to treat them like we, we use preventive therapy like we do with uh, cerebral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, etc. Regenerative therapy is still in the trial phase, so hopefully in the treatment we'll have better options of treating our patients. Now, with regard to vas uh, spinal vascular malformations, there are several of them. We're focusing here on the one that has shunt. And all you need to know is that we can divide them into low flow shunt and high flow shunt. In the case of high flow shunt, it's hardly that you can miss them because of all the uh, flow voids that you will see clearly in the image. Many times there's are congenital in young patients now, what's more important for us is the low flow shunt, because sometimes we can miss them if we don't see the uh, flow void. And we will focus at the most common one here, which is spinal dural AV fistula. Usually a classic presentation would be an older male. Uh, history of back trauma or surgery important as the trigger for the formation of this fistula. Usually the present was subacute presentation, slowly progressive, thoracic myelopathy. Maybe there is stepwise uh, worsening. But a very important clue in history of the patient report recurrent worsening with physical exertion, well, salva maneuver. Uh, the patient might report after walking a long distance, I will have urine retention, I'll have severe weakness, and then I rest, and next day I'm fine, and these things tend to repeat. Acute worsening is possible if hemorrhage or thrombosis uh, occur. These cases, you want to rule them out before you proceed with your workup of myelopathy because you want to avoid using steroids, your standard therapy. Steroids will make the patient rapidly decline and severely worse. Lumbar puncture should be also avoided if possible because they can make the patient worse also. Sometimes this worsening can be permanent and it's not reversible. Lastly, a treatment usually is surgical disconnection of the fistula or embolization. So, when we investigate those patients, CSF tend to be sometimes inflammatory, mostly with high protein. This has been frequently reported. Spine MRI usually showing longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, mostly reaching the conus. Contrast is present in 85% of cases. And there is something quite interesting in the contrast. If you can see here, in the middle of the contrast, there is a missing, a missing piece here. And they call this a missing piece sign. This seems to be very specific for spinal derby fistula. Flow voids, not always there, but if you find them, you can be more confident in your diagnosis. Sometimes we need to give contrast to see them. MRA will be more helpful. And the gold standard is digital subtraction and geography. This, despite being the gold standard, this really operator dependent. There are several cases that have been uh, reported that they were negative. And when they just reviewed the images, they were able to find the fistula. Other patients, they had to 
do it again before they were able to find the fistula. So at this point, we're considering myelopathy as our diagnosis. We went through the history and everything to check if it's arterial or venous infarction or there's compression. Our first test to order will be a spine MRI with gadolinium. Preferably you do a whole spine, unless you're very confident it's cervical spine if the patient has quadriplegia. If you're considering vascular disease, make sure they add DWI and ADC to the MRI sequences. And then if you find compression, you'll send them to surgery. If you find dural AV fistula, surgery or IR. If there is spinal cord infarction, you'll manage accordingly. And then we proceed to lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture sometimes would show you infectious picture and that will take you toward the direction of um, an infection. Now, there are specific patterns that you can get from spinal MRI. And here I'm gonna show eight patterns that are highly suggestive of certain etiologies. So we'll start with the worst nightmare for neurologists, which is getting a normal MRI when you're really considering myelopathy. So number one, you should think about alternative diagnosis. Are you sure it's myelopathy? Maybe it is GBS, maybe it's myasthenia gravis, maybe it's something in the brain. So revisit your diagnosis. If you're sure it's myelopathy, number two would be maybe you image too early in the first hours or even days. Sometimes you don't have a clear picture from the beginning. So maybe you repeat the image days or a week down the road. In cases of myelopathy with normal MRI, Examples would include something like perineoplastic myelopathy. MOG myelopathy sometimes can have a normal MRI. So multiple sclerosis, usually the lesions are short, they are peripheral, and they enhance homogeneously or have rings-like enhancement. Sometimes in rare occasion, there might be a stack of short segment myelopathy, giving the illusion of longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. In this case, you want to look at the axial section where you might see a lesion here, down, you don't see a lesion. So this will tell you that these are short segment lesions and not one longitudinally extensive one. With regard to NMO, the classic presentation is longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. Usually it, the enhancement is patchy. Sometimes there is ring-like enhancement. Uh, the cord will have a central lesion, swollen cord. If you see ring-like enhancement in a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, this highly suggests NMO versus other inflammatory causes of long lesions. With regard to MOG, usually it gives you long to the extensive transverse myelitis, sometimes reaching the, the conus. An interesting thing is increased T2 signal in the gray matter only, given the H sign. That'll be interesting if you see it. Doesn't pick up contrast that much. Now, with regard to sarcoid, something specific would be the dorsal subpile enhancement. This highly suggests sarcoidosis as the cause. And when you add to it the central canal enhancement, you can get what's known as trident sign. And if you remember, we heard also trident sign, not in the spinal cord, in the pons. And this is associated with central pontine myelinolysis. So trident sign in the spinal cord is the one that's related to sarcoidosis. In cases of spondylosis, they can also have long to an extensive lesion, right? And most of us will probably have some uh, stenosis in uh, the cervical spine, most likely, and lumbar also spine. So one special sign here would be enhancement in a band-like fashion. Some people call it uh, pancake sign, where you have the width is bigger than the height of the lesion and it's right below the maximum point of stenosis. If you see this pattern, this suggests highly that this is spondylosis. On axial section, you will see a circumferential lesion sparing the gray matter. All these suggest more that this is spondylosis. Perineoplastic myelopathy would think about it if the patient having longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis again in the center of the cord, I'm sorry, long to the sense of uh, transverse myelitis that is tract specific and usually symmetric. And they do enhance. If all these combined, you will think of perineoplastic myelopathy. If there is no enhancement, maybe we'll think about something else like B12 deficiency. And lastly, in cases of metastasis to the spinal cord, they have this very interesting rim and flame sign. You can see the flame with the contrast enhancement here. 
another one here. This is seen usually with metastasis to the spinal cord. So moving forward, at this point, you're most likely dealing with inflammatory transverse myelitis. And in this case, you have four jobs. Number one, acute therapy. Number two, determining the cause, prevention of future attacks, and lastly, rehabilitation and symptomatic management. This is the framework that we can use to understand the goal, the goal of using acute therapy. So the patient will have inflammation usually, demyelination would be there, and there will be axonal transactions. The only part that we have medication to work on and we can control is the inflammatory part. And all of us have dealt with transverse myelitis patients who we give in steroids, and within a week, you have seen improvement in these patients. That by itself confirms that inflammation in and by itself is enough to cause symptoms and interruption of the signal transduction along the spinal cord. Because in one week, you don't have time to remyelinate or improve or fix axonal transactions. So to choose our therapies, one way to look at it is to divide our patients into four groups. According to the segment length, short and long segment, and according to the symptom severity. For a patient with mild to moderate disease, short segment myelopathy, most of the time there's going to be idiopathic transverse myelitis, CIS, multiple sclerosis, most likely. If a mild to moderate severity patient has longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, it might make us think of sarcoidosis because sometimes it has symptoms that are, that are out of proportion to the image findings. Next, if the patient has long segment and severe weakness, classically we're thinking NMO, MOG, um, in addition to systemic disease like lupus, we can also throw their ADEM and paraneoplastic etiology. If along with the severe weakness, the patient has short segment, most of the time it's going to be early MRI, but NMO also can present with short uh, segment in 15% of the cases. Now, the best way to approach this, if it's mild to moderate, you can start with steroids, most commonly IV methylprednisolone for five to seven days. If the patient become more severe, resistant, or he started with severe uh, weakness, I would start IV methylprednisolone and plasma exchange from the beginning. Plasma exchange is very safe and the outcome is very favorable when you add it from the beginning. Some cases like when lupus is there, adding cyclophosphamide has some evidence. And then I know you're guys thinking about IVIG. It has less evidence compared to other um, etiology, uh, treatments, but it's been used as second line with steroids in many cases. So that would be an option too. To determine the cause, this is a classic list of workup that you would do. Brain MRI, rule out MS, or assess the risk of transition to MS. NMO and MOG antibodies, especially cell-based. Rule out systemic diseases with Chagrin, lupus, and phospholipid syndrome. B12 and copper, if you're considering that. Chest CT is better than you, for sarcoidosis than doing chest X-ray or uh, ACE level. And more specifically for sarcoidosis, if, you, if chest CT is not uh, diagnostic, is PET CT whole body. That will help for sarcoidosis and tumor at the same time. And some paraneoplastic antibodies, if the case indicate. Now, with regard to using preventive therapy, there is no evidence uh, to support using preventive therapy in cases of idiopathic transverse myelitis, no matter how severe it is. And remember that medication used for MS the disease-modifying therapies, they tend not to work in NMO, sarcoid, and others. So it's very specific to choose your uh, treatment based on your specific diagnosis. And don't underestimate the value of rehabilitation and symptomatic uh, management in these patients. Now, a couple pearls and pitfalls on certain inflammatory etiologies. First, when you label a patient with idiopathic transverse myelitis. In other words, you did not find a cause for it. So in a review here of 226 cases, they found that only 18% of the idiopathic transverse myelitis were actually idiopathic. The rest of them all, almost all of them were they found a diagnosis to explain it, between infection, between tumor, between um, inflammatory disorder. Sometimes they even find that the patient didn't have myelopathy to begin with. And with regard to transition to MS, so if it's complete transverse myelitis, the risk is low. 
the risk will go higher if it's partial transverse myelitis and even much higher when MRI is abnormal. Oligoclonal band is an independent risk factor and the risk for idiopathic transverse myelitis is only 10%. NMO was covered earlier, so I don't think I need to go into details of it anymore. Lastly will be spinal cord sarcoidosis. Remember that the image will be out of proportion to the deficit you see on the patient. They have a subacute course at least 21 days. The gadolinium enhancement would last for months. So if on repeat imaging you see enhancement that lasting months, think of sarcoidosis, think of tumor, and think of spinal cord infarction. Um, usually the treatment is prolonged. We'll try to dissolve the sarcoid either with steroids or with infliximab. Now, while we treat the, our patients, we at this point probably getting the results of our workup and probably we reach a final diagnosis at this, this stage. And final thought, when no confirmed diagnosis is reached, I strongly suggest that you send the patient for a second opinion. Myelitis or myelopathy is pretty rare and to build an expertise, you really need a center with a lot of cases to build those expertise. So second opinion is very valuable. Keep the label undiagnosed there because sometimes it takes time to reach a diagnosis. And lastly, biopsy in cases that were labeled undiagnosed did uncover many times the stuff that we would pick up by our usual methods like demyelination, sarcoid, uh, neoplasia, infection. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jassim and the organizers, Dr. Samar, for this very good for the invitation and for the conference. Thank you, Dr. Tare, for this nice presentation. Now